Hey church, my name is Cedric and I'm one of the leaders here at Coastline. Thank you for having church online with us today. We're so glad you're joining us from wherever you are and we thank God that through technology, we can keep reaching you with the life-giving message of Jesus. But look, we know that church at home is a little different. However, our hope is that you would engage and participate in today's worship experience. So as we get ready to worship here in just a few moments, I invite you to join by singing the song if you know him or by simply lifting your hands and surrender to Jesus. And as we hear the message that God has for us today, engage with our community in the chat room or comments. And we know that as you connect and engage, you'll position yourself to receive all that God has for you today. Thanks again for joining us now. Let's get ready for a time of worship. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never filled me Waiting for change to come Knowing the battles won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You never failed me yet Oh no I know the night won't last Your word will come I will sing your praise again Jesus, you're still enough Keep me within your love My heart will sing your praise again Oh yes, I will Promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You never fail me yet Oh, no I believe 
Hey church, my name is Zion and I'm one of the leaders here at Coastline. Thank you for joining us for Church Online. We're excited to have church with you today wherever you may be attending service right now. If you feel like you're not connected or like you're out of the loop with how we're responding to our current situation, here are a few ways that you can stay in the know. Real life change happens in the context of a life-giving community centered around Christ. And during a time where physical distancing is necessary, we must stay relationally and socially connected. Over the past few weeks, our groups have been meeting online via Zoom. And if you'd like to start a Zoom group or join a Zoom group, visit us online at coastlinechurch.org. For parents with children at Coastline Kids, we want to help you keep your kids engaged with their relationship with God and help them experience the fun that they have here at church. Our kids team is producing full kids services for them to play at home and providing resources for parents to help them grow in their faith. Check it out online at coastlinechurch.org and follow Coastline Kids on Instagram for daily lessons, fun content, and ways to stay connected in our community. If you're a middle or high school student, you can stay connected with groups daily devotionals, and messages made just for you by your pastors and leaders by following Coastline students on Instagram. Though times may be uncertain as things are changing daily, as a church, we've chosen to respond rather than react. And right now, our church is mobilized throughout our county, partnering with local food banks, schools, and organizations to maximize our efforts in meeting the needs of our community. Until we can safely re-enter our schools and public spaces, every Saturday at 10 a.m. at our Carlsbad campus, we are providing free groceries to anyone in need. And thanks to your generosity, we've already been able to feed hundreds of families. But our work is not done, so to learn how you can get involved, make a donation, and serve during this time, email serve at coastlinechurch.org and follow the Coastline Dream Center on Instagram. Coastline Church is the church that prays. That means prayer is our first response and not our last resort. And we'd love to pray with you over any needs that you may have. You can request prayer by emailing prayer at coastlinechurch.org and you'll have a team of people praying for you throughout the week. Thanks again for joining us for Church Online. We look forward to getting to know you. So hop in the chat room or in the comment section and let us know where you're experiencing this weekend service. Also, stick around to the end of the service to learn more ways to get connected and join our community. Now let's get ready to jump into this week's talk with our lead pastor, Aaron Jane. Welcome, church. I, I want to start today first by just publicly letting our staff know how much I appreciate them. Uh, I, I wish you could see how hard our team is working right now behind the scenes to serve and love and care for our church family. I've never seen our staff pull together the way they're pulling together right now because of their heart and because of their love for this church and I just wanna publicly acknowledge them and thank them for all of their hard work. I could not do what I'm doing right now without the team that is behind me. And so if you're in relationship with any of our staff, would you text them today, call them today, send them a message today and just tell them how grateful you are for the job that they're doing. I'm just so proud of them. And I wanna say thank you to our church right now for your faithfulness and your generosity during this season. Nationally, what we're seeing right now, as I talk to a lot of my pastor friends, is many churches right now are down about 40% in their giving. And for obvious reasons, there's a lot of people who are out of work right now and businesses that are struggling and and fighting to survive. And, And the economic pressure is very 
real right now. And I wanna thank you for your generosity. As a church, currently we are down about 30% in our regular weekly giving. And, and that's really good news for the season we're in. And, and to let you know, we operate currently on about 70% of our average income, which means right now we're breaking even as a church. And that's because of your faithfulness and your generosity. And as I look at the season we're in right now, there's two groups of people out there. There's the people who are making money and the people who are not making money. Now, what we're seeing with COVID-19 is there are a lot of people who are actually making more money through this because of the nature of their business and the way they pivoted and the way they've adjusted and they're capitalizing on this situation and rightfully show because they're providing a service that is so needed right now in this current season. But there are also a lot of people out there who are struggling right now who have been laid off, who have been furloughed, businesses that aren't operating right now, that are just struggling economically. And here's what I wanna to say to the two groups of people. If you're in the group that's making money right now, think about the church and think about what God is doing in the middle of this and help us during this season be the light in the world because right now we're the hope of this world with all the fear and all the anxiety and everything going on, we're able to give people a solid rock to look to in Jesus Christ. And then for those of you who are in a really difficult time right now, we wanna know about it because we wanna know if there's any way that we can help you as a church family. We feel called to take care of our church. And we're doing a lot right now as a church through our weekly food drive and our medical response team that has been built and all the different compassion ministries that are taking place in Mexico and here in North County. But we wanna make sure the families of our church are served first. And if there is a need in our church family, we want to know about it. So would you let your small group leader know or contact our team, contact our church, and let us know if there's a way that we can serve you and help you during this season because we are the body of Christ and it is our mandate to care for one another during times like this. And that's why we budgeted our church the way we budgeted our church, where we live beneath our means so that when times like this happen, it doesn't crush us financially, but we can weather this storm because we budgeted ourselves that way to weather storms like this so that we can be here helping, loving, and serving people. And, and I want you to know for every person that has called our church for help in our church family, here's the good news. We've had an average of four people called that wanna help. Think about that. For every person that needs help, four people are calling that wanna help, that wanna give, that wanna serve, that wanna make a difference. And that shows me the heart of our church and the difference that we're making during this time and during the season. And I want you to watch a video of our food drive. We've fed now 400 families to date and we're still feeding and it's still happening on a weekly basis and you can be a part of it. So take a look at this video with me at what you as a church are doing through your compassion and your generosity. And if you'd like to be involved, get on our website and find out how you can be involved because we'd love you to be involved because this is gonna go for, for a little while longer and we wanna be there serving and caring for the needs of our community. Watch this video with me. Lord, I just pray over today, Lord, that you would just bless our conversations, bless our hands, Lord. May we share not only this food and the nutrition, but Lord, also your love and your joy and your peace. Lord God, I pray for each and every person who comes through today, that they would sense the difference here, knowing that the Holy Spirit is present. It is more than just food, God. It is Jesus. It is the everlasting King who is inviting them to know that he loves them and cares for them. God, I pray blessing over each bag of food and over each family who comes. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. In your precious name, amen. Amen. Church. My name's Emma and I'm here today with the Coastline Dream Center passing out meals to families in need right here in our community. We are so thankful for your generosity, every bag of rice, can of soup, juice box that you've given because it really is making a difference in the lives of these families. If you
you want to serve or help, or if you or someone you know needs help, please contact us at serve at coastlinechurch.org. No need is too small. No donation is too small. We're just thankful that we get to receive and help during this season. Thank you, church. Come on, I know it's awkward. I know you're sitting in your living room or your office, or maybe you're even still in bed, but give yourself a hand for the difference that you are making serving and loving and being the light of Christ in this time. As we jump into the message today, I want to prepare you spiritually for the season we're in by helping you understand some of the things that are taking place. As many of you know, our church has joined the movement Unite714.com. Unite. 714.com. And to give you an update right now, Unite 714 has just become the largest prayer movement in the history of mankind. I know that's a big statement, but I'm telling you the truth. It is the largest prayer movement in the history of mankind. Every major church, every major pastor, every major Christian leader all across the world has now joined together to pray. Second Chronicles 714 over our nation and over the world for God to heal our land. So what I'm asking you to do is every morning at 7.14 a.m. and every evening at 7.14 p.m. set an alarm and stop and say a prayer. Second Chronicles 7.14. On the website unite714.com which you can see right here on the screen you can actually download resources and there's a prayer. You can download a weekly prayer and you can just read and pray that prayer at 714 every single day. And this is very important right now because we are on the verge of one of the greatest revivals in awakening, spiritual awakenings in the history of the world. I believe that with all my heart. And here's why. The message God has given me for Easter next week it is truly going to be revolutionary because as I began to think about Easter, when you think about Easter, Easter was Satan's greatest victory in all time. Think about it. He killed the Son of God. He killed Jesus. You don't get a greater victory if you're the devil than killing God's Son. But what was Satan's greatest victory very quickly turned into his greatest defeat as God flipped the situation on him. Jesus rose from the dead and gave the church the power to set up his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Well, if you look at COVID-19 right now, it looks like Satan's greatest victory of our generation. Think about it. This is the first time in years the church has not been able to meet in its building on Easter. And I'm sure the devil is jumping for joy right now at what he's done. But what he doesn't realize is what his greatest victory appears to be is going to turn into his greatest defeat in this generation. God spoke to me this week very clearly. He said, what if we're supposed to be online this Easter so that we don't just reap thousands this Easter, but we reach as a big C church millions this Easter. I believe with all my heart this Easter is going to begin a revival in our nation and I want you to be a part of it by helping us invite people to our Easter services next week. And God has put a message on my heart on end times in, in a prophetic message for where we're at right now and what's really happening with this COVID-19. And I'm going to show you and I'm going to answer the question, are we in the end? Is this the tribulation? Is this, you know, Revelation 6 and the four horses of the apocalypse? And the answer is absolutely not. And I'm going to help you understand that next week and give you a message that is going to be full of hope, full of encouragement, and full of the gospel, the story of Easter. So if you know anyone that is freaking out right now, dealing with terror, dealing with fear, dealing with anxiety, people wondering, is this the end times? Is this the tribulation? Invite them next week to Easter. It is going to be a message that is going to mark our community, mark our church, and mark our lives. So I'm going to join you to be a part of that. We cannot do it without you. We need virtual evangelists to go into the online world and invite people to join us at Coastline Church next week. And then one more thing, Good Friday. We are going to do a special Good Friday service online. We have declared through Unite714.com, Good Friday is going to be a national day of communion. 
a national day of communion. And we're gonna put together a special communion service for our church on Good Friday. And I want you to join us. I want you to plan on attending with your entire family and have your communion elements ready. Because we are believing, what, what spiritually is going on is we're in a Passover season. You know, the Passover in Exodus 12 was a plague of death that was spreading across the land, very similar to COVID-19. It is a plague of death. And those who had the blood of the lamb over their house, the plague of death passed over their house. That's what communion is all about. It's, it's a representation of the blood of Jesus Christ that we believe over our life so that this plague of death will pass over our homes. This Good Friday service is going to be very, very important. Whether you're a believer or not, whether you're a Christian or not, whether you're part of our church or not, I want to invite you to join us and receive communion with us as we believe God to see this virus eradicated in the name of Jesus and this plague of death pass over our nation and not destroy anyone else. Join me for Easter, join me for Good Friday. And then finally, this communion thing is important. That's why as a church, we do it every night, Monday to Friday at 7 p.m. You can join me on my personal Instagram account, at Aaron Jane, you can see it here, or my Facebook page. And every night we go live as a church and receive communion together. It's a very important season right now that we receive communion on a daily basis for our home, for our family, for our physical bodies to pray that the body and the blood of Jesus cover our life. Very important in this season right now. So join me Monday through Friday, 7 p.m. and we talk about it and we receive it together. Let's jump into the message again. One of the incredible things that's happening during this quarantine is when you get isolated and you get alone with God, you get revelation. Isolation produces revelation. Like I'm spending time with God and as I'm studying his word, he's showing me things in the word that are, are, are incredible, that I'm so fired up, I'm so full right now, I can't wear it. wait to share this message with you. Now we're in Psalm 91. It's one of the most beautiful Psalms in the Bible of God's protection, God's favor, God's hand over our life, guarding us from just the attacks of the enemy. One of the things it talks a lot about in Psalm 91 is the pestilence. The pestilence is a deadly disease or a deadly virus. The pestilence is COVID-19. And Psalm 91 is a, is a chapter of protection against pestilence. This is a time we need this chapter over our life. So Psalm 91, what it is, it's a beautiful picture of Hebrew poetry. Now Hebrew poetry is not like our poetry that rhymes, the way Hebrew poetry works is it takes two concepts and it gives them to you at slightly different angles so that you can see it in 3D. It makes the idea concrete. And what it is, it's a promise. And God doubles that promise to let you know this will happen. This is certain. It's concrete. It's going to take place in your life. Last week, we looked at verse 4 of Psalm 91, and it gives us this picture of God, this 3D picture of God where God is a mother hen. You know, a mother hen will lay down her life for the chickens. If, if a coyote comes in to take one of the chickens, she'll give her life to protect her chickens. Jesus gave his life to protect us, to save us from death. But then it also gives a picture of God as a mighty warrior who has the ability and the strength to fight on your behalf. Jesus didn't just die on your behalf, he conquered the grave, he conquered death on your behalf. We get this beautiful picture of God through this doubling image. Well, today we're gonna go back to the first two verses. What I love about God's word is you can dig it and mine it for years and years and years and never reach the bottom. Like you, you can look at the same verse for years and never get all out of it because it's living and it's breathing and there's always fresh revelation in God's word. So we're gonna go back to chapter one because, or, or verse one because as I was reading verse one this week, all of a sudden God began to download new, new revelation that we, we didn't, we, we dug a lot out of verse one and verse two last week. We're gonna dig even more out of it today. I'm fired up about this. If you can't tell, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, verse one, here we go. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. There's the three concepts. 
shall abide, abide connects to dwell, under the shadow, shadow connects to secret place of the Almighty. Almighty connects to uh, Most High. So you see the doubling. You, you see three different concepts at slightly different angles that, that double. Well, where I want to go today is I want to look at each of those lines individually and break them apart and pull the truth out of it. I want you to remember a principle that we teach often at our church that we call the road to Emmaus principle. The road to Emmaus. After the resurrection of Christ, uh, before he was revealed to all of the disciples, there were two disciples traveling on the road to Emmaus. And all of a sudden, Jesus and his resurrected body is walking with them. And, and they don't recognize him. They don't, they don't see who he is. And they're very sad because Jesus was just killed. And Jesus looks at these guys and he said, why are you guys so sad? And they said, are you a stranger? Do you not know what just happened? They just killed the Messiah. Our hope was in the Messiah. And they killed him. And Jesus, starting at that point, took them all the way throughout the Old Testament and showed them that every single thing in the Old Testament points to him. Every letter, every word, every punctuation mark, every story, every verse, every chapter, it's all about him. At the end of it, they, they're, they're having dinner and then Jesus gets up and, and he's gone. And all of a sudden they realize that was Jesus. He was sitting with us. And here's what they said. Did not our hearts burn within when he revealed the scripture to us? You see, the road to Emmaus principle is everything in the Old Testament is about Jesus. The key to understanding the Old Testament is find Jesus. When you find Jesus, it creates a burning heart. I want to show you Jesus today in these verses. Here's verse 1. Here's the first phrase. It says, he who dwells. The word dwell in Hebrew is yeshab. Yeshab means to sit or to be seated. Very important to understand, it means to sit. It means to, to be seated. In Psalm 47, verse 8, it says God sits on his holy throne. God yeshab on his holy throne. Then the next phrase, in the secret place. What is the secret place? What is the secret place? Here's the secret place. The secret place is inside of Christ. It's in Christ. Ephesians 2, 6 puts it like this. God raised us up with Jesus Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the secret place. We are seated in Christ in the secret place. And then that last part, most high, is the word for God that is El Elyon which means high and exalted. Well, El Elyon in the Old Testament is Jesus Christ. Philippians 2 verse 9 tells us that. Therefore God exalted him, meaning Jesus, to the highest place. God exalted Jesus to the highest place. Jesus is El Elyon. What does this mean? What does this mean? This means that God's protection Psalm 91 is all about protection. This is the first line of the chapter. God's protection is found in rest. In rest. It's not in your striving. You don't work for God's protection. You don't earn God's protection. You don't do enough good things to deserve God's protection. It's found in in rest. You see, to be seated in the Old Testament is a picture of rest. To be seated in the Old Testament means you're no longer working. Now, that's hard for us because in our world today, most of us work sitting down. Like we go to an office and we sit down to work. In the Old Testament, you worked standing. There, 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 were, there were no office jobs in the Old Testament. Your work was done on your feet. You stood. Think about the temple. This is an illustration of the temple. The very first temple in the Old Testament, Solomon's temple, the temple that Solomon built, there was a lot of furniture in the temple, but if you notice something, when you study the temple, there are no chairs in the temple. There's tables, but there's no chairs. Why? Because a priest never sat down in the temple because a priest's work was never done. So the priest would come to the temple at nine in the morning for the morning sacrifice, and then the priest would work until three in the afternoon for the evening sacrifice. Now, by the way, Jesus was put on the cross at nine in the morning and he hung on the cross 
until three in the afternoon, becoming the morning and evening sacrifice when he died at 3 p.m. And the Bible says that after Jesus died, he was risen from the dead. And what happened? He sat down at the right hand of the Father. Why did he sit down? Because the work was done. The work was done. In the Old Testament, the work was never done. The priests would never sit. The work is now done. It is finished. Jesus sat down. He said, it is finished, meaning all of your sins are forgiven. There is nothing left for Jesus to do. You are forgiven. If you are a believer, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are forgiven past, present, and future. If you're not a believer today, we'll tell you how you become a Christian at the end of this message, but you need to know even now Jesus has paid for your sins. Even now all of your sins have been paid for. Now you have to decide whether you want that gift of forgiveness because God's not going to force it into your life, but your sins have already been paid for. You just have to receive the forgiveness for that payment. So what is this a picture of? Well, I want to help you unlock Psalm 91. I want this, this chapter of protection over your life. I want it over your family. I want it over your house. Here's the key. The very first line, number one in your notes, we rest in Christ's finished work. We don't earn it, we rest in it. We rest in it. This is a picture of resting in what Christ has done on our behalf. Remember Ruth, the book of Ruth, chapter two, Ruth works all day long with her own sweat and her own blood and her own effort. And at the end of chapter two, she walks away with one ephah of barley. In chapter three, it's a picture of rest. She comes and she rests at the feet of the redeemer, Boaz, who is a picture of Jesus. She rests at his feet. And at the end of chapter three, she walks away with six ephahs of barley. In a place of rest, we always receive more from God. You want God's protection, rest in what he's done for you. Don't try to earn it. Don't try to work for it. Too many people take Psalm 91 and they turn it into a legalistic doctrine of, if you want God's protection, you've got to do this and you've got to do this and you've got to you know, read your Bible eight hours a day and pray and you've got to be really good and make sure you didn't sin and make sure you didn't do this and then God will protect you. But if you mess up, you're in trouble. No, 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 no. This is available for every single believer. This may be your first day as a Christian. It's available to you. You may have been a believer for three years. It's available to you. You may have made a mistake last week. It's still available to you. Why? Because it's not about your work. It's about Christ's work. Don't rest in your ability. Rest in his ability on your behalf, which is available to all. Because in the secret place, that's where protection is found. Uh, let me show you another picture in the Old Testament of Christ, the ark. Remember Noah's Ark? Noah's Ark is a picture of Jesus. It's a picture of Jesus. Look at this. Noah and his family, where did they go when the flood came? They went into the secret place. They went into Christ Jesus. They went into the ark and not one drop of rain fell on them. Why? Because they were in the ark. And they, 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 they rose above judgment. This is what's available to us as believers. We can go into the secret place. We can go into Christ Jesus. We can go into the one that is high and exalted. And remember the ark, the ark didn't have any windows along the side of the ark. Why? God doesn't want you looking at all the terror and all the fear and all of the trouble that's all around you. There was one window in the ark up top. God wants your eyes on him right now. He wants you to focus on him. He wants to be your secret place. And all you've got to do is rest in what Jesus has done on your behalf. It is beautiful. So let me give you some advice. Don't listen to the news. Listen to God. What do I mean? Don't listen to the news. You can watch the news. There's nothing wrong with staying informed, but we don't listen to the news. We listen to truth. We listen to God's word. We listen to what God has to say 
about us. This is where we put our hope, not in what the news is saying and what God's word is saying. There's nothing wrong with staying informed. I watch the news, I stay informed. I don't listen to the news, I listen to God's truth. And, and, and here's a beautiful picture of the ark for you, especially for those of you that struggle with, man, I'm just not good enough. I just, I struggle to believe that God is gonna do it for me because I still make so many mistakes. I want you to think about Noah for a moment. Noah inside the ark. What would happen if Noah fell down in the ark? Well, here's the good news. If Noah fell inside of the ark, he still could not fall outside of the ark. See, here's the good news for you. You can't fall out of grace. You can only fall into grace. So let's say you make a mistake. Let's say you sin. Let's say you blow it. Let's say you do something you regret. You don't fall out of God's grace. You fall into God's grace. Why? Because you're forgiven. You're forgiven and you are righteous because of the finished work of Christ Jesus. You are not righteous. Righteous means right with God. You're not right with God and accepted by God and loved by God because you deserve to be. None of us deserve to be. The only one that deserved to be was Jesus. You are righteous because of the finished work of what Jesus did on the cross for you. All you have to do is rest in the truth, rest in the fact that I am righteous today because of Jesus. You see, righteousness, if you really want to know what it really is, it's your last name as a Christian. Think about this. When you were born, you didn't earn your last name. I've got two boys at home. When they were born, I didn't say, you know what? Before we give you our last name, we just need to make sure this works out. Like, I'm gonna make sure that you don't end up in jail. I'm gonna make sure you don't end up on drugs. I'm gonna make sure that you get into a good college. And if you do all of that, then I'm gonna give you my last name. No, they got my last name the day they were born and they didn't do anything for it. They got my last name because of who I am, not because of who they are. You are righteous today not because of who you are. You are righteous today because of who your father is. You got your last name when you were born again. When you were born again as a believer, as a Christ follower, God gave you the gift of righteousness, something that you cannot earn. And so what I want you to do is rest in the finished work of Christ. Rest in his grace. Rest in the fact that you are forgiven. You see, when Jesus sat down, that meant all your sins were paid for. There, there's nothing left undone. Stop beating yourself up over your past. Jesus sat down. He said, it is finished. It is forgiven. It is finished. There is nothing left for you to do other than rest in his finished work. And here's what will happen. Look at the, the next half of the verse. When you rest in his finished work, you will abide under the shadow of of the Almighty. This is a picture of spiritual intimacy. You see, if you abide in somebody's shadow, that means you're very close to that person. If you've ever had a really tall friend, I had a friend who was six foot nine. He was very, very tall. When we'd walk outside, he would cast a shadow. And if I was close to him, I could abide in his shadow, but I had to be close to him to abide in the shadow. You see, this is talking about spiritual intimacy. If you don't get the first half of the verse right, you're not gonna be close to God. Why? Because if you feel like you're not forgiven, if you feel condemned, if you feel guilty, if you feel like you're not good enough, if you feel like I blew it, I failed, God doesn't like me today, uh, all that's going to do is drive you further and further away from intimacy with God. What brings you into intimacy with God is resting in the fact that you are forgiven, resting in the fact that God loves you, resting in the finished work of Christ. There's nothing left for you to do, it's finished. All you have to do is sit in the secret place of the Most High, and then you will abide in the shadow. You will be intimate, you will be close with the Almighty. Now, the Almighty is Shaddai in Hebrew, the unconquerable one. Do you realize when you're close to God, you're walking in the shadow of somebody that cannot be beaten? That means when this COVID-19 looks at you and you're in the shadow of the unconquerable one, COVID-19 says to itself, I can't touch that person. They cannot be beaten because they are in the shadow of the Shaddai. 
They are in the shadow of the Almighty. But to be in the shadow, you've got to rest in grace. You've got to rest in forgiveness. You've got to rest in the gift of righteousness. You've got to rest in the finished work of Christ. I had a friend when I was in seventh grade. I used to get beat up a lot in seventh grade. Um, got bullied and picked on. I had a friend, next door neighbor, Andy Armandaris, and I got beat up all the time until I became friends with Andy. Why? Because Andy was like six foot four in the seventh grade. He, he was a football player. He was big. And for whatever reason, Andy liked me. Like, well, like we became friends. And, and here's what I know. Anytime I walk down the hallway with Andy, not one person messed with me. Why? Because I was in the shadow of somebody that could not be beaten in the seventh grade. I mean, he was huge. There was, there was not one kid in our school who could fight Andy and win. Like, he would take out anybody. And when I was in his shadow, when I was next to him, when I was in his presence, I was safe. I'm telling you right now, when you rest in the finished work of Christ, you will be in the shadow of the un conquerable one. It's powerful. Now let's go into verse two. And this is where it gets really practical. This, this kind of helps you understand now, now how do I really put legs to this? How do I put legs to verse one? Here's number two. Declare the truth of Christ's finished work. The first thing I want you to do and rest in what Jesus has done on your behalf. The second thing is you got to begin to declare it. You've got to begin to speak it. You've got to begin to say it. This is where verse 2 takes the truth of verse 1 and teaches you how to apply it and how to apply the rest of the chapter. So let's look at verse 2. Now remember, there's a doubling. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him will I trust. Now, most of the chapter, the doubling is one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, like you saw in verse one. Verse two, the doubling is different. It's one, two, three, three, two, one. So you've got the statements at the end that book in the verse, and then you've got the statements in the middle, and then the statements in the middle of that. So you've got refuge and fortress in the middle, then you've got the Lord and my God, and then at the end, and this is what I want you to catch. Moses is the author of this psalm, puts these concepts together. They, they may not look like they should be together, but he puts them together. I will say, I will trust. I will say, I will trust. In other words, if you're not saying, you're not trusting. If you're not saying God's word, you're not trusting God's word. If you're not declaring the truth, you're not trusting the truth. I will say, I will trust. Let me, let, me, let me help you understand why this is so important during this season. During crisis, during trouble, during tragedy, you need to hear God's voice. You need to hear God speak to you. How does God speak to us? Well, the primary way God speaks to us is through His Word. God speaks to us through His Word. His Word is living, it's breathing, it's alive. He speaks to us through His Word. So we don't just read, I will say of the Lord, we say of the Lord. What do I mean? I don't just read the verse, I will say of the Lord. I actually out loud with my tongue say of the Lord. Or, or let me put it like this. Instead of it saying, I will say of the Lord, read it like this, I will say for the Lord. I will say for the Lord. Here's the thought. What would it look like if I gave God my tongue? What would it look like if I gave God my mouth and I allowed God to use my tongue to speak for him into my life? How does it work? When I read the Bible out loud, I'm reading God's word. I'm, I'm allowing God to use my tongue to speak his word and his truth, and my ears are now hearing God's voice. I'm using my tongue. God is using my tongue, but it's his voice. He's using my tongue, but it's his words. He's using my tongue, but my ears are hearing truth. They're hearing faith. They're hearing the word. They're hearing God's voice, and it ministers to my heart. It, it builds up my spirit. So when I say God's word with my mouth, I'm giving my heart the very same thing it would get if God himself spoke to me audibly. 
When people give in to fear and anxiety and, and depression and, and worry during times like this and, and crisis and trouble, what's happening is they're putting more stock into how they feel than into God's Word. They're putting more faith into their feelings than faith in God's truth. See, we have to say of the Lord. And what are we saying of the Lord? We'll go back to the verse. It says, I will say of the Lord, you are my refuge and fortress. Now, let me explain this to you. Refuge is a shelter or a bunker that protects you from a storm. Fortress is a massive palace that protects you from an invading army. What is God saying? God is saying, I want to protect you from the small attacks in your life, and I want to protect you from the large attacks in your life. In other words, there is nothing too small that you will ever go through that is too little for God's concern. And at the very same time, there is nothing too great for God's power. God cares about every battle you face, whether it's big or small. God wants to be a refuge against the little attacks in your life, and he wants to be a fortress against the big attacks of the life. But we've got to use our tongue to say of the Lord, you will be my refuge. You will be my fortress. See, here's the challenge. I'm type A. I don't know if you're type A or not, but type A people, our minds are always going. Like I'm always, my mind is always running. It's always calculating. It's always problem solving. It's always trying to figure things out. And that's, that's, that's the reason a lot of people deal with worry and stress and fear is because their minds are always going and, and, they're, and they're always pondering and, and worst case scenario and hypothesizing and trying to figure out the situation and the mind's always running. We've got to find a way to slow our mind down. We've got to find a way to steady our mind, to calm our mind. How do we do it? How do we do it? Well, God's given you a mechanism that can really get hold of your brain, and it's called your tongue. Your tongue. I, I do this every week. When you are speaking out loud, it's very difficult to think about something else than what you're talking about. Like when I'm speaking every week, when I'm teaching and preaching every single week, it's very, very difficult for me to daydream and for my mind to wander when I'm speaking like this. And the same is true for you. God has given you the ability to steady your mind. And it's through declaring, it's through speaking, it's through saying. The question is, what are you saying? You see, as a human being, we receive information through one of five senses in our body, seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, and smelling. But there is a sixth sense that every human has, and that's your spirit. That's a spiritual sense. How, how do we receive information in our spirit? How do we get information into our spirit? Well, it comes through God's word, through his spirit, that bypasses our physical senses. Here's the power. God's word is living and breathing, living and breathing. When you read the Bible out loud, there's a double operation taking place. Yes, your ears are hearing sounds. Your ears physically are hearing words come out of your mouth. But greater than that, your spirit is hearing the voice of God, which is supernatural, which is living and breathing, and it's feeding your spirit and building your faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And what's actually taking place is you're convincing yourself of truth. Every time you speak out loud, you're convincing yourself of something. If you speak negativity, you're convincing yourself of the worst. If you speak and declare God's truth, you're convincing yourself of God's truth and it's building your faith and trust in God. That's why Moses says, I will say, I will trust. I will say, I... let me give you an example. Luke chapter 24. Jesus, after the resurrection, he's with the disciples. They're still kind of, you know, in shock. He eats some bread to show them he's alive. Like, look, I'm eating bread. I've got a physical body. The bread's coming in. I'm eating bread. I'm alive. I'm not a ghost. I'm eating bread. But that doesn't convince them. So what does Jesus do? He takes them through the Old Testament. And he shows them everywhere in the Old Testament that points to him. And it was the word of God that convinced them that Jesus was the Messiah. You see, the word has power. Scripture 
has power. That's why Romans chapter 10 and verse 10 says, for with the heart one believes. We don't believe in our mind, we believe in our heart. We can understand with our mind, but we believe in our heart, we believe in our spirit. With the heart one believes unto righteousness. Again, that's the gift of righteousness. We're given by Jesus and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. This is how God's word takes it from your head to your heart. And the way you quick start that process is you read God's word out loud. Say it, trust it. Not say it, not trust it. Learn to speak God's word in trouble, in crisis, in tragedy. Declare God's truth over your reality. So you've got the option. You can bring your faith down to the level of your circumstances or you can exercise your faith to declare God's truth over your circumstances and watch God's truth change your current reality. God's truth has power. So this is what I want you to do. This is what we're learning today. Rest in the finished work of Christ. Rest, rest. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to work. Jesus did it on your behalf. And then declare the truth of Christ's finished work. And let me show you as we close how to do this. I want you, during this season, as long as we're in this season, I want you to take Psalm 91 and I want you to declare it out loud over your family, over your house, over your physical body, every day during this season. Here's how I do it. You get Psalm 91 out and you personalize it. You read it over yourself. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. What I say is, if I rest in the finished work of Christ, I will stay near the one who cannot be beaten. If I rest in his finished work, I'm going to stay near the guy who cannot be conquered. For I will say, for the Lord, for the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. God cares about the big and the small challenges that my life faces. Surely, not maybe. Surely, this is going to happen. This is certain. He shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. Perilous is deadly. Pestilence is disease or virus. He's going to save me from this deadly coronavirus. He shall cover me with his feathers and under his wings I shall take refuge. His truth shall be my shield and buckler. I shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at my side, 10,000 at my right hand, but it shall not come near me. I want you to declare this by faith. Only with my eyes shall I look and see the reward of the wicked because I have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, my dwelling place. No evil shall befall me, nor shall any plague come near my dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over me to keep me in all my ways. In their hands they shall bear me up, lest I dash my foot against the stone. I shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion, the serpent, I shall trample underfoot, because I have set my love upon him. Therefore, he will deliver me. He will set me on high, because I have known his name. I shall call upon him, and he will answer me. He will be with me in trouble. He will deliver me and honor me with long life. He will satisfy me and show me his salvation. I will say, I will trust. I say that every day because I trust it. I trust it. And because I trust it, I say it. And because I say it, I trust it. And because I trust it, I say it. I want you to declare God's truth. Now let me invite you as we close today. If you're not a believer, you're not a Christian, you, you, maybe you've never been to church before. Maybe somebody invited you to watch this message. You've heard the gospel today. And I want to be crystal clear with you right now. Everything I talked about is available to you starting now. It's all available to you. All you have to do is receive the gift of forgiveness. 
receive the gift of what Jesus did on a cross on your behalf. Yes, you've done bad things. I get it. You've done things you're ashamed of. You've done things you regret. Some of you even thinking to yourself right now, there's no way God could ever forgive me. I'm telling you right now. Jesus went through the most horrible death you could possibly imagine so that the filthiest, dirtiest, wickedest, most evil sin action ever committed could be forgiven. No matter what you've done, you can be forgiven. But you got to understand it's a gift. It's a gift. God is not going to force this gift into your life. He's not going to make you take it. You've got to receive it. And the way you receive it, we read it, Romans 10, 17, is you believe in your heart. You believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, that Jesus went to a cross and he paid for all your sins so that you could be forgiven. And then God brought him back to life as his son and savior of the world. And then you confess with your mouth. You say something out loud. Now, here's the beautiful thing. God is looking for you. Think about this. This whole COVID-19 God did not send it, but he's using it. How is he using it? There are so many of you watching me right now that would have never stepped one foot in our church. And God loves you so much, he brought our church right to your bedroom. He brought our church right to your living room. He brought our church right to your phone. That's how much God loves you. It's not an accident you're listening to me right now. I'm telling you right now, God loves you so much. He's after you. He wants you to be a part of his family. He wants to save you. He wants to forgive you. You would not be listening to me right now if God didn't love you. So don't think that God doesn't love you. Don't think it's too late for you. Don't think you've too far gone. He loves you and he will forgive you right now if you'll confess with your mouth and accept Jesus as the Lord of your life. And so what I want you to do is everyone bow your head with me right now and just close your eyes for a moment. Those of you that want to give your life to Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer after me. And when you say amen, I want you to click the little button on the screen that says, I gave my life to Jesus. I want want you to let us know that you just prayed this with us. Right now, say, Jesus today, I give you my life. Forgive me of all of my sin. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that you will never hold my past against me. Today, I make you my Lord, my King, and I give my life to live for you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. And can I tell you, everything we talked about today is available to you. It's not available to people who've been a Christian for a long time. It's not available to people who have read the entire Bible. It's available to everyone because of what Jesus did on all of our behalf. So I want you to step into Psalm 91 and receive the favor, receive the protection that God wants to give you. Click right now that you prayed that prayer with us. We want to know about it. And then contact our team. We've got some information for you. We want to pray with you. Go into one of the prayer chat rooms right now and let us pray with you about the decision you made. God's got great plans for you. I love you. Thank you for joining our church today. Church, have a great week, and let's get ready for Easter. Thanks for joining us for Church Online. We hope that you enjoyed your time with us. If you'd like to connect and learn how you can take your next steps here at Coastline, visit us online at coastlinechurch.org or by selecting the Connect tab if you're in our Church Online platform. It's how you faithfully and generously give that allows us to continue making a difference in our city, our nation, and our world. And because those of you that give, pastors around the world are in training to take the gospel to places it's never been. Our children's home in Mexico is rescuing abandoned and abused children. And right now, because of your generosity, students and families in our community can know that they'll have food to eat this weekend through our food drive. And with their continued faithfulness and tithing and giving, We will continue to reach people so that they may know God, find freedom, discover their purpose, and make a difference with their life. We've made online giving easy with Pushpay. On your desktop, visit give.coastlinechurch.org and follow the prompts. I also want to introduce you to our text to give option. You can now text Coastline CH and your amount to 77977. Since it's your first time, you will need to complete a one-time form safely linking your card to your smartphone. 
After you're done, you will receive a text confirming your gift, and in the future, you'll be able to give anytime from anywhere with a single text message. We're going to continue to pray for all those people who are affected by this virus. We're praying for those who are ill, for the leaders and medical professionals on the front lines, for those struggling financially, and for those experiencing fear and panic. What we know is our God is good and His love is unchanging. And the Word tells us that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. We love you, church, and we hope that you have a great week. Join us Monday on Instagram and Facebook for live prayer with Pastor Aaron at 8 a.m. See you guys for Church Online next week.